Discord. <laughs>
last week, you heard from Raleigh that like this was covered entirely not using official church funds, which is just amazing to me. I'm the entire amount. Cool. The entire yeah, yeah. amount. It was, it was over five thousand yeah. dollars, and the church, the, the church funds that we had set aside, we're not even touching, which is incredible, just incredible. And Justin's actually um, going to be going to the school tomorrow to hand over that check, mm -hmm. and then they will be recognizing Justin and, and Peace Hill, of course, church, yeah. um, the whole church, not Justin. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> 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 they'll be doing that at the school board meeting on Tuesday, which is at what time? Uh, Six thirty. So if anybody wants to be there to witness this, you can go to the school board meeting over at the county offices at 6.30 on Tuesday, and Justin will be there, and I might too. We'll see how it goes. Um, there's a bunch of cool stuff going on on the 21st, which is this coming Saturday. There's a farmers and artisans market over in the Charles City Government Building Complex. And then after that, or like in the midst of that, there's also a resource fair. So Check that out um, if you're able to go. I think it would be a really good time and there's some interesting information that you would be able to gather too. And then this is a new thing that we're gonna try out this year. So hopefully y'all are on board with this. For Pentecost Sunday, which is June 5th, we would really love it if you all would consider wearing the colors red, orange, and yellow, which is supposed to symbolize the flames of the Holy Spirit sending. So we'll continue to announce that. If we remember it, we remember it. Great. If you don't, no worries. All three at the same time? No, no, no. no any. Any or all. Oh. Any or all. Just in the red, like this would count. Any in the red, orange, or yellow category. Like, whatever your skin tone works well. Does Hunter's Blaze Orange count? Sure. <laughs> Why not? Those are the announcements, and then I'm taking these two with me, and we're going to go do mazes. Captured, but uh, this community is in shock. Um, there were grandmothers and, and children and um, people who were just trying to go about their lives in their neighborhood. And uh, so we heard about this um, last night, and he is claiming to have done this in the name of in the name of uh, us good white folks of the country, um, which of course we reject. Um, but I want to take a moment and pray for that community of Buffalo, which I'm sure is reeling today and for all of the others who are affected by this. So please take a moment and come to God with me. God, our hearts are heavy, our minds are shocked to hear of this awful deed that has been done. We feel shame and repulsion that it was done in our name and we are so grieved for all the people who have died and those who have lost loved ones who didn't even get a chance to say goodbye because they were only going down to the grocery store for a few things we pray for our black brothers and sisters who um, are going to be now having to feel that new fear even just going to the grocery store um, or other places that one never expects uh, to meet violence and death. We pray that you would uh, be with them, encourage and 
strengthen them this morning as they, they grieve yet another um, thing that has been done to their community. We pray for justice um, and for all those who are working to investigate and prosecute this crime, um, that there would be justice done. And as we, we hear of the ways that this young man was radicalized, um, we pray that you would stifle the mouths and uh, shut down and, and frustrate the hate speech that goes around, whether in print or online, or even just from mouth to mouth. Turn the hearts of those who are so wickedly hateful and um, make us aware of ways in which we um, belittle any other group or make them seem like a threat that needs to be eliminated. We ask that you would soon bring the day when all races and all nations are at peace. Amen. So, a bit of a whiplash Sunday from good to bad. Um, we have been in a series uh, through the post-Easter Easter appearances of Christ and the resurrection appearances and, and also just about what the resurrection means in general. Uh, but when we learned um, several days ago that we were going to be completing this uh, school lunch debt payoff, um, I wanted to take a Sunday to talk about that. I have said before, but it needs to be said again, how incredibly proud I am of this church. Um, going back years and years, uh, for many years, even going back to the living room days, of the way that um, this church has been of outsized generosity. Um, from person to person within the community, from family to family, and even to strangers. Um, and these past couple of years, as there's been all kinds of economic hardship and the pandemic and everything, you guys have very much stepped up. And um, there's been all kinds of donations to all kinds of, of groups. Um, and just this week, you know, we're taking this check to the school board and then uh, um, the lady from Thrive is coming by to pick up um, this, these donations for a, a family in need that was moving. And then the day after that, uh, no, the day before that, someone's coming up to pick up a bunch of eggs that Jesse's donating to the hungry. And uh, it just keeps going and going. And um, I, I am so thankful to God for the generosity that has been expressed through this church. So um, I wanted to take a look at a Bible passage that talks about generosity, that talks about where it comes from, where it should come from, how it should look in our lives, and um, what it's for. Because we can always use a second look at things, even things that we're already trying to put into practice and already do, to hear more about what God thinks of it. So, a little bit of context. Um, 2 Corinthians is written when Paul is taking up a collection among all his Gentile churches and all these churches that he started in Greece and Macedonia and all these other parts of the Mediterranean for the church in Jerusalem and the Israel area, which was having financial hardship. Um, there had been a series of things, there had been a famine, um, as you know, many of the new Christians that started out in Jerusalem had been persecuted or had lost their homes or had been sort of ostracized from their families because of becoming Christians. So they were in need, they were poor, and uh, Paul took up a collection among all these churches, which is amazing when you think about it. All these um, Gentile churches donating to people that there's no way that they'd ever met, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So part of his letter of 2 Corinthians is reminding them that uh, the collection time is coming up and that this donation is something he's going to be seeing them about. And he writes about how they should think about this. So I wanted to read 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. This is the uh, NIV, the New International Version. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, and then he quotes from a psalm, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, 
He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, uh, Paul and the others who are collecting this gift, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So, I want to say three things that Paul says about generosity in this passage. The first thing is that generosity should be freely given and unforced. And I'm not just talking in, in all of this about money, although that's that's the prime focus of what he's talking about here, but also generosity of, of time, of talents, of um, you know all the kinds of ways that we can help other people. But the first thing he says about it is that it should be free and unforced. Zero in on that phrase, God loves a cheerful giver. That's what God is really excited about, is someone who's giving cheerfully. Now, I kind of like having deadlines and standards and um, exactitude. So if somebody gives me a task to do, I would like to know exactly how much I need to do, um, when I need to do it by, what the uh, exact parameters are. I think in some businesses they call it, what, what are the deliverables and what is my schedule? And um, it would be easier, I think, in some ways, if we had um, an ironclad rule about generosity. If, if God laid it down and said, you know, everybody is supposed to give away 30% of their money and 10% of their time to the, the church or good causes or whatever, and, you know, 5% of your emotional, you know, cushioning that you can sit and listen to people's problems or whatever it is, um, that would be nice. And we would have a thing and you would know if you if you'd checked it off and you could feel like, okay, I just got to get to that and then I can quit. But that's not what God did. And if you think about it, it's not really what we want either. So uh, those of you who are married, think about your spouse. Those of you who are in other families, think about your, you know, maybe your, your parents or your, your, your loved one or your child. Think about it. If they came to you at the end of the month, we'll, we'll say spouses. Say they come to you at the end of the month and they've got an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> with all the different cells and everything filled in. And they say, all right, so here's my summation. Um, I said I love you one time this month. So that's checking the box because that was our minimum agreed upon number. And um, I made coffee for you twice. Um, and I didn't say anything when you worked the other day. And um, that is on our agreement and checklist of the, the love that I am supposed to give you. So, okay, I got it done, and you should be you should be happy. I have accomplished the minimum. <laughs> now, some of you would, I think, take a frying pan to that person um, and not to cook them dinner. You wouldn't want that. You would not enjoy that. You would not feel that that person was showing love. You would feel that they were doing something because they had to, and they were meeting an obligation and checking a box, and that they were um, keeping track of it and doing it begrudgingly. And that is the same thing God says. He wants us to, um, to give to the needs of others, again, in all different forms, whether financial or other, out of overflow of gratitude and love in our hearts because we want to help them, because we want to bless others as we've been blessed, and not because we got to grit our teeth and do it. Yes, it is the right thing, but that's not how God motivates people. There's so many commands in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, that don't just say, although he could say, they don't just say, do this, 
because God said so. Um, sometimes it gets down to that, but so many times, especially in these New Testament letters, you'll, you'll see this pattern of this is what God has done for you. And so, so you can do this because you're grateful or because you're excited about it or whatever else. God loves it and gets excited about it when we freely give to others. And that determines the amount, that determines the timing, whatever. Because it shows that we're looking like our Heavenly Father, who generously gives, not because he's like begrudgingly, uh, Justin, I gotta, I gotta give him oxygen again this morning and, you know, sunshine and some cereal. Oh, I guess. Okay, I gave it to him. Fine. I've done that. I don't have to think about him until tomorrow morning or whatever. Um, no, he gives freely. He gives to people who don't even like him. And um, he gives freely and he wants us to have that family resemblance. So if you find yourself not feeling like this, if you find that, that giving of whatever, of your time or your money or your resources or whatever, is feeling like forced and under compulsion and begrudgingly, I, I have two things to suggest. Um, first off is it's possible that you're feeling pressured, whether external or you know, hidden expectations or whatever, to give in ways that you actually aren't capable of giving or don't have. So um, if you are feeling like uh, you're way over committed and yet someone asks you to help with something and it's you know another three hours of time and you say, well, I guess I gotta do it because God loves a cheerful giver and I guess I gotta go do it. You know, wait before you say yes because it could be that you don't need to be giving any more time. You don't have that. God's not asking you to give what you don't actually have, um, whether that be money or, or time or whatever. So it could be that, uh, you are just tapped out of that particular resource and it's not going to be up to you to give to that thing. But the second thing is, um, if you find that, that you're only begrudgingly giving to anyone or, or helping anyone or being generous, it might help just to, and I know it sounds corny, I used to hate that song, Count Your Many Blessings. I think it's because I don't really like the tune. Da, 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 count Your Many Blessings. Um, I don't really love the way it was played, but it's very true. Um, there is something about thinking about all the ways in which God has blessed us, all the ways in which um, we have been abundantly blessed, whether it be material things or uh, privileges or education or, or um, a place to live or, you know, you can go on and on about the beauties in the natural world or a church or whatever. And then thinking about, which Paul talks about in the chapter before this, Christ who gave all to us, Christ who was rich and yet for our sakes became poor so that he could bless us. The more you think about that and the more you really stop to meditate on that about how much you've been given, the more grateful your heart will become, the more you'll want to look for ways that you can imitate that and love other people. So generosity should be free and unforced. Um, secondly, generosity brings a greater return so that you can in turn go back and do more good. So there's a couple places where Paul says this. The very first verse of this passage, he says, Remember this, whoever sows, like sows seed sparingly, will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. <clears throat> so, um, I feel like I really ought to take up more gardening and farming just so I understand a lot more of these metaphors because the Bible is full of them. But I do know enough to know that in order to get a big harvest, among other things, what you have to do is plant a lot of seeds. If you only plant two seeds, you're not going to get, you know, a whole row of plants. I guess if you were planting trees, you might get a whole tree with a lot of fruit out of one seed. But if you're planting plants, you, you have to sow generously in order to, you know, make sure that you get a big crop. And so he's saying it's the same thing here. There is, built into the way God has made the universe, something that if you are sowing sparingly, you're only going to get back sparingly. If you're sowing generously, you're going to get back generously. Now, I have to say, some uh, Bible teachers and Christian teachers and pastors and churches have really misused this verse. Um, it has become, it's, it's probably why a lot of us are reluctant to preach on this topic or this um, verse, because it's been tainted. Um, they, they talk about um, sowing a seed by donating so they can get a new jet for their ministry or whatever. And they'll use those words and they'll say, well, if you sow generously, 
God will give to you generously. And what they mean or what they elaborate on that is that God will make you rich. That God will solve your money troubles if you give a lot of money to this organization, whatever it might be, or this person. And uh, they keep you on the hook that way. And people have made, unscrupulously, a lot of money that way. God isn't saying, if you give a bunch of money to the church, you're going to become rich. Um, what he does say, and it's, it's very clear, is he says, when you give, you're going to find that God not only provides for your needs, but he gives you more to give with. Do you see the difference? It's not more to hoard. It's not more to, to make you wealthy. It's more so that you can be generous. He says it two different ways. In um, verse 8, so that's uh, in this first paragraph, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having what you need, you will abound in every good work so that you'll have enough to give to others. And then uh, further down, he says, you will be enriched in every way, in the second paragraph, so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. It's not saying if you give, you're going to be rich. And if I or anyone else ever promises you that, it's a big red flag. It's like a <coughs> big red flag. It's saying you can trust God because a lot of you might think, well, if I give away, you know, I have a little bit of money, but if I give away any of it, I'm not going to have enough for me. And so that fear keeps us from being generous or time or whatever it is. And uh, God is saying, you will have enough. If you give and you are giving stuff away because you are trying to be generous, God will provide. And this is it's mysterious, but I've seen it a little bit, and I've, I've heard people talk about it and testify that this is true. When you give a little bit, when you try to stretch a little bit to be generous in some way that maybe stretches you, you start seeing resources you didn't know you had, and you start seeing areas of need that you didn't know about among other people. You start finding other ways to be generous, and it starts becoming more natural to you so that it becomes easier to do. Because generosity is a muscle, like any of these other spiritual habits. And the more you do it, the more you're able to do it. Um, in Malachi, when people were holding back from, from giving uh, so that God could support the ministry of all these people that were uh, working in the temple, he said, test me and see if this isn't true. If you give, you will have enough. I will give what you need so you have enough to be generous to others. So, generosity should be free and unforced. Generosity will result in you having more so that you can give and do even more good. And then finally, generosity brings thanksgiving to God. Um, in this last uh, section, this last third that your text is divided into, he says uh, in the second line, it's the service that you perform is going to overflow into many expressions of thanks to God. Because of this service, others will praise God. It will result in much thanksgiving to God. It results in credit to God. I want to be um, really clear. So uh, the the school board is going to, uh, the, the superintendent is going to announce to the school board that they've got this donation on Tuesday. And they said, if people from your church want to come, you can stand up, we'll say thank you, and that'll be it. Um, if that happens, or if we give to this, uh, this family that you guys were collecting household goods for, or if we give food to the food banks, or if we give school supplies to the kids that need school supplies, or if we give to all the other causes that we've given to. And the result is that people say, well, those people are really good folks. Those people are, are nice folks and, <coughs> and cool, and I admire them, and, and gee, those are nice people, uh, or, or nice rich people, or horrors, nice white people, or whatever it's gonna come across as, then we're, reaching down from our moral and uh, financial high ground and, and uh, rescuing you poor slobs down there who don't have as much, that will be a failure no matter how much bread or how much money we give away. You see? If, if it shines a spotlight on us so that we look good and that's the end of it, it will probably actually have done more harm than good. What Paul says here is that the end result should be in people 
thanking God for what God's people had done. It's the same thing, pretty much, that Jesus <coughs> says in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, um, let your light shine in such a way before people that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, we made the decision not to keep it you know, secret. We're not like, uh, we didn't call the TV stations, but we, we called the school and we said we want to do this check. It's not anonymous. You know, we're saying it comes from this church. We want them to know that the church did it. We told them exactly why we were doing it. We were doing it because God blessed us and we wanted uh, to be blessed, blessings to other people and God frees us and we want to free other people from debt. We were quite clear on that, but um, because we want to let our light shine before people, and in a world that has plenty of reasons not to like Christians, we want there to be reasons for people to say, look, this is people doing a good thing. We want people to look at churches, not just us, but at any churches, that are doing unexpected acts of goodness and righteousness and generosity and justice and truth and kindness, to see that and to say, hmm, I want to know more about whatever could motivate people to do that. That's why we don't just do, we try not to just do the ordinary stuff, like just, you know, give something to someone you know that, you know, that's nice, you know, give a present to somebody you know, but doing something for people who uh, you don't owe anything to, who, who you don't even know perhaps, is a statement. And Paul was saying this, he's saying, when people see Jewish churches receiving help from Gentile churches, that's a witness that God is real and is doing something to cross those old boundaries. And that is going to lead to people wanting to say, I want to know more about this God that acts like that. Because these people are saying that they just are imitating their Heavenly Father. I want to know more about that person. Another way in which it brings Thanksgiving to God is, if you see uh, in the uh, last section here, he says, um, end of the third line, he says, Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. The obedience that results from your confession. So, talk is cheap, right? Anybody can say, I'm a Christian. Anybody can say, can confess Christ, which is what this means, to confess that Jesus is Lord, right? And um, we live in a world that's, had, that's more talk than it ever has been before. Television and YouTube and radio and, and TikTok and everything and people and writing and publications, there is endless talk of what life is for and, and what Christians are about and what, what the world means and what, what life should be about and what Christians should act like or should stand for. People need words, but they also need to see actions that back those words up. As the book of James says, um, you need deeds to show that your faith is genuine. And so these are the actions that accompany their confession of faith in Christ. And so when we say things like God is generous, God is loving, God provides, God forgives, if we do something to go along with that, it gives weight and meaning and truth to these words. So we want credit to go to God because God's the one that has given us these things. Um, and we want to um, inspire them to believe that God is real and true and beautiful. So... This week, um, our church is going to do these things. We're, we're doing these things publicly, and uh, we want to do them. They are the right thing to do, and we are very grateful that we can do them. But all of us in our lives will have opportunity. And I want to say again, it may be money. It may be that that's what you give. It may be, you know, maybe eggs from your chickens. It may be um, a word of encouragement, picking up the phone and calling someone or texting someone who needs it. It may be... Um, just stopping for a minute, turning off the noise, and praying for someone who you know needs it. Or listening to someone who maybe just needs a few minutes of your time. Or, or mailing a card to someone. You know, the, the opportunities are endless. But if you find yourself uh, feeling begrudging, just remember all the ways in which God has loved and forgiven us, especially, most pointedly, in Christ as he loved and forgave us through giving up everything he had. And I hope that that will make us a people as individuals and as a church that is more willing to let that gratitude overflow into actions of real service that make a real difference. Let's pray.
God, we thank you so much that you have given um, given our church the resources to pay off this debt, and that over the years, uh, from from the building of this building to uh, all the the deeds, public and private, that have happened of generosity and kindness and uh, help, that you have inspired people to give cheerfully and willingly, and uh, overflowingly so that people have seen it and have noticed that there is a difference. We pray that our confession would not just be with our mouths, but that it would also be with our hearts and our hands and our lives, that we will show with our actions that we believe that you have given us all things and that there's more coming from you so we don't have to worry and we can so generously. Help us to believe that you'll make sure that we have what we need. In the name of Christ.
talking about some of God's priorities.
God, help us to see each morning and each day how your mercy and care and faithful love for us is renewed. Help us in that confidence that you are always with us and providing for us to be a generous people, not to bring glory to us, but to bring glory to you. Now as we go out to share this food, we thank you for um, the meal. We thank you for um, all the different ways in which you provide food for us and for the labor that, that went into finding and buying and preparing it. And uh, we pray that our conversation around the tables will strengthen and encourage us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Birthdays. Amen. Amen. Amen.